Uh, what I've got to say this morning, and please at the back or the side, you can't hear, do and shout out. I'm going to take the hit slowly. Uh, and Vera's going to stop me at um, 10 to when I shall give you some handouts. I'm about to give you an extra five minutes to read them. If I have not quite finished what I got to say, I have pleaded with her to have ten minutes at the end. But in my present state, I mustn't feel rushed. This morning, I shall be concerned with a, a person. Joe Brown, a middle-aged shop steward. But I shall begin and end with Wordsworth. Some new members won't know what I mean, but there are many people who will. Um, when I say that I um, wish that my brother Alan was here to read, and I haven't got Alan's voice, I haven't got Alan's feeling of the poetry, but I shall do my best. I shall hope open with his passage, which I have quoted many times before, here and elsewhere. I shall quote it again, as I often do to myself in a psychotherapy procession with Betty Smith and Joe Asmus, and particularly when I feel we're stuck, when we're getting nowhere. Can't do with noises. Yes. The mind of man is framed even like the breath and harmony of music. There is a dark, invisible workmanship that reconciles discordant elements and makes them move in one society. Army, that all the terrors, all the early miseries, regrets, vexations, lassitudes, that all the faults and feelings that have been infused into my mind should ever have made up calm existence that is mine when I am worthy of myself. Forty-five years later, Wordsworth altered this particular poem out of the prelude and the passage, it is a different one. The dark, invisible workmanship is now an immortal spirit that grows like harmony in music. And the passage now ends uh, as follows. How strange that all the terrors, pains, and early miseries, regrets, vexations, lassitude, interfuse within my mind. So there I have borne a part, and that a needful part, in making up the calm existence that is mine, when I am worthy of myself. Interfused is perhaps better than infused. Made up has been amplified a born and needful part. Pain is added to the miseries and vexations. But the passage leaves us with a mystery. And these curious words, I and myself, I said earlier that with Betty Smith and Joe Ashworth, I quote to myself. 
I hope to be worthy of myself when out of our stuckness in the procession discordant elements might move in one society of the world the elements in the society which is in our world but as we wonder about the strangeness of I and myself let's listen to a story told long ago by a rabbi the rabbi Hennig and he said it's about a man and he said, this man was very stupid. Uh, and when he got up in the morning, he was a bit like me, I think so. It, it was so hard for him to find his clothes. Uh, and this worried him so much that he was anxious when he went to bed at night uh, and really couldn't get to bed for thinking of the trouble he would have when he wakened up. <laughs> but then one evening, he uh, finally made a great effort and he took a piece of paper and a pencil and as he undressed he noted down exactly what he had on <laughs> the next morning the, uh, the head well pleased with himself he took the slip of paper in his hand and read cap there is the cap and he put it on his head <laughs> pants 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 that, and put on his pants and uh, so it went uh, on until he was fully dressed. But then he said, that's all very well. But now, where am I myself? <laughs> and he asked in great consternation, where in the world am I? He looked and looked, but it was a vain sight. He couldn't find himself. And that is how it is with us, said the rabbi. Now this story expresses what I often feel when I read or hear, hear a psychiatric history. Such accurate descriptions of the cat and the pants and the symptoms and the great-grandmother's depression. <laughs> but yet, there is a penetrating question for me and for you. Where in the world am I? Where am I myself? Now, this talk is concerned with some very fundamental features of day-to-day -day psychotherapy which are relevant to the needs of thousands of many so-called ordinary people in the northwest region of England where I now work or try to insofar as the health service will allow me <laughs> where I work as the only accredited psychotherapist and the question with which faces me is what can be done in a 20-minute interview and my talk is not concerned with his analysis five times a week last five years it is concerned with 20 minutes now that the Hasidic aphoristic story that I told of the rabbi suggests my main theme the difference between classifying ex externals and realizing experience. Realizing is say, making real. And I shall be concerned mainly with this difficult word, experience. So can you hear at the back, John? Hmm? Only just. Sorry? Only just. Only just. Well, well I will, I, I'm sorry, I'll direct my voice it's somewhere up there. Uh, that better? Yes. Uh, and both. It, 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 that, 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 I'm sorry, I know I tend to go inside myself and mutter. Uh, but of course, the only answer to my question about that 20-minute interview 
is that there are no ordinary people. Everyone is an extraordinary person who can move towards being more worthy of himself as he acts in his life. And as I thought, I shall have at the back of my mind, sorry, I must speak up, uh, I'm busy reflecting on the saying of, I can't pronounce the Chinese, Lao Tzu, is that all right? Tzu. 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 Dr. Maitland uh, always has the scholarly answers. Tzu. <laughs> uh, <coughs> the way to do is to be, he said. Now, let me try to convey a little, and it can only be a very little, of a meeting with Joseph Brown, Esquire, our shop steward, a successful shop steward. For the last few months he has been depressed and has had fainting attacks, for which no, no organic cause has been found. Now, that's all I know about Mr. Jones. Um, but um, just now, I don't want to list a um, catalogue of so-called facts about him. I want to begin to know him. Knowing and knowing about. That's one of the important distinctions that I want to make in this talk. Our first handshake is very one-sided. His fingers are limp, and there is no answering pressure to my slight squeeze. There is no conversation, because we speak with each other with our bodies as well as with our words. But that doesn't mean that Mr. Jones has not said anything. He has, he has said a very great deal. And his body language becomes more eloquent as he sits down, rigidly erect, with arms tightly folded, and stares out of the window. Now, I want to achieve and to express some understanding of what he is experiencing now, at this moment. And, seeing him perched on the edge of his chair, I try out a crude metaphor. I, uh, I feel you're uh, all on edge, I say. I suppose it's an odd situation, coming to see a chap like me. He shifts, slightly, but that's all. I try again. Uh, I reckon it's not easy to put into words, but I'd like to know something about the problem, about the sort of thing you would like help with. I'm giving this accurately, but you see I've gone a bit wrong too early. I know inquiring about is a problem. But I, but I do hope that I have conveyed to Mr. Brown my wish to understand something, a little something, <coughs> of what it is like to be him. Now, Mr. Jones shuts his eyes, screws up his face, drops his head, and unfolding his arms, he um, twists his fingers as if boring a hole in his forehead but he doesn't say anything. And I see his tension increasing. He seems to me to be getting into a panic. And I don't want his um, desperation to block him. So I make a guess at what he is experiencing. I say, it's, uh, it's hell when you... Uh, when you just can't get anything out. 
he puts me right, speaking urgently. No, no, there's nothing. Nothing there. Nothing there. They say I do my job, but it's not my job. Like a machine, it is. Getting the, the, the figures right. A thing moving about. I can't carry on. There's no me. Nothing inside. I'm nowhere. Mr. Jones drops his hand and looks at me. Looks for a response. I knew that I now feel that a conversation has begun. But I don't know how to proceed. I shall return to this developing conversation from time to time as I try to make some sense of my curious title, Being and Doing, in Swahikothahadavi, but with special reference to what I do. At 10 to 11, I shall give you some ha handouts of a conversational model. And on page 2 and 3, you will find that there are 20 points and technical points, uh, and there's 20 points, uh, I think, all that I have achieved in um, God knows how many years, 30 odd years of doing psychotherapy. There are 20 simple points. Yet, like many simple statements, they body forth profound complexities. In my talk, with Mr. Brown. So far, I have illustrated it in Latin of them. Now, for me, the, the significance of the odd word being is often intimated more strongly by close attention to the minute particulars, the little unremembered acts which are portrayed on a videotape as I watch myself interviewing and they are conveyed to me often better than by the reflection on general concepts such as archetypes, projective identification, the individuation process and the transcendent self and you won't hear, hear any of that, of that sort, of, sort of language this morning not because I think it may not be um, valuable but for me at the moment I want to try to say things in other words well I am occupied in the research, in hard research, concerned with hard, in quotes, data. But, but yet, I've already quoted Blake and Wordsworth, two romantic traits. Uh, and I suggest, though, that it's only in scrupulous attention to the details of how a man behaves that we can by an act of creative imagination, catch a fleeting vision of what he is. But I shall later distinguish different modes of doing. So, uh, let's for a moment turn to a technique. A technique which has to be learned by long and hard practice. See, so he's watching my own videotapes. Uh, I uh, sometimes think that for many years, as an analyst, I've been like a cricketer. Uh, you always have to put up with, with the cricket metaphor here. But I've been like a cricketer, uh, trying to bat in a five-day test without having learned how to keep it straight. It's the minute particulars of how we talk with, how we be with people. And, uh, of course, facts have only meaning within the context of a theory, and on the handout there's an outline of a model. Uh, but, until I'm shown wrong, and in the research, I hope that my aim is a scientist one to, to show that I'm wrong, I contend that my 20 points are, are relevant not only to psychotherapy, but to teaching, to social work, to talking with friends, 
and to buying a, a good steak from a bad tempered butcher. <laughs> <laughs> but for, for the time being, we will ignore the handout, uh, and we can be return to it after you have the time to hold down through it, uh, and we can discuss the um, theory. So I want to return to my sentence that I used earlier. I want to achieve and express, I said, some understanding of what he, Mr. Brown, is experiencing now. And what can one say about experience? Now, suppose we all sit in silence for one minute, which isn't long enough, but it will do, and ask ourselves, what am I experiencing? How am I now, at this moment? Ask the question of yourself, but don't try to answer it in words. Just let it be, and feel it. How can we express our experience? We, we can't. <clears throat> At least not all of it. <clears throat> Sensations, emotions, also concrete and elusive images, and more than that, some words, ideas, thoughts, and meaning. A kind of perhaps felt meaning, partly explicit, but also perhaps intimations of implicit and emerging meanings, what I call moving meanings. Well, let me, although I said I can't, say something about experience, and I just want to make four points about the sort of experience which I'm talking about now. It is pre-conceptual, it is before a concept. It is incommunicable as a whole. But although no words, gestures, or actions can exhaust it, it can be differentiated. You know, you can get uh, bits out of it. You, 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 you can differentiate patterns and um, units. And the breaking down of the you, 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 um, units is um, endless. As I stand here, uh, and uh, there's my fuzzy head, uh, there's this room, uh, and that pillar I don't like there. Uh, the sensations in my tummy, which are awful, worries about yesterday and tomorrow, the fleeting memories and uh, indistinct emotions. Right, well now, trains of thought, words, movements, drawing and, and painting, a phrase of music, might emerge from it, but the experience is preconceptual. And anything that can be said or done can only be one aspect of this immediate, raw, sensed and felt stuff of awareness, the just thereness. It can't do justice to the complexity and interrelatedness of experience. So point one, it is preconceptual. Two, it is felt in the body. Or perhaps in isn't right. I wonder whether you got in your bodies in that moment. Mm. That concrete sense of life of, of the body, as it were, as felt on inside. A sense of being in a place, or a sense of knowing a person, is a gut feeling. But it also has cognitive thinking, situational and observational aspects which gave, gave rise to complex thoughts. So now number two, immediate experience is body. Three, experience is always in relation to. I am afraid of, I hope for, I am angry at. Experience in this sense, in this raw sense, 
is neither inside nor is it outside. And hence the hyphenated phases that our existentialist friends uh, use like being hyphen in hyphen the hyphen world hyphen lovingly being in the world lovingly all at once you see you want to really to draw it out as a pattern you don't want to put it end to end and Martin Bulwer's I hyphen thou I thou uh, I think one of the great cloud windows in my life was reading Martin Buber's I and Thou, which of course shouldn't have been called that, it ought to be called I hyphen Thou, which he talks about later on. So it's always in relation to. For experiencing now includes the past. But if I weep for a past re rejection, it's happening now. Alton in his poem in memory of Sigmund Freud puts it very well speaking of Alton Freud he wasn't clever at all he merely told the unhappy present to recite the past like a poetry lesson so the past is there but more important my experience is guided by the future my hopes and fears, my anticipations of what shall be, what might be, what is hoped for, shape my experience now. But more than that, if I stay a while with the raw experience, possibilities emerge. And experience, if you, if you, if you stay with it, isn't a hemostatic. There is a movement. I keep using this word move from word with onwards. There is a movement. There is a carrying forward. And it's carrying forward in steps of experience, which I see as the, uh, as the fundamental thing in psychotherapy and indeed in um, for henship. And of course it can be done with somebody in, in 10 minutes even, sometimes. So I want to say something more uh, about, first of all, about psychotherapy technique. And many of you say I'm not talking about psychotherapy at all, I'm talking uh, about being with folk. However, the number one is the carrying forward. Now, what in inverted commas I would call genuine, it's not a, such a good word, but genuine thoughts, words and acts are makings. They are creations and they involve steps of feeling. Uh, it'll be clear to you I'm using this word feeling not in the sense of affect only, I'm using it as a feeling of experience which involves thoughts, images and emotions and very different from a, a particular urge of, of an affect. Now, the steps of feeling and that I mean, a bodily felt continuity of change. And now it's the manner. I'm trying to work in a... I know this section of my talk might be a bit abstract or sandy, but it's not really. <laughs> Very much in one gut, um, guts. But it's the manner in which it is done. And that which is more important than the content. It's a matter of maintaining sufficient contact with the raw experience whilst symbol formation occurs so that shifts in experience are not too abrupt nor are they merely repetitive I'll come back to the manner and the content later on and explain it more but let's go back to who, uh, um, Joe Brown who I'm, I'm sure you're like me you feel we have kept him waiting uh, <laughs> Well, Joe Brown, our shop steward, says uh, he had a bit of a Lancashire accent. I'm sorry that it wasn't more, but a, a bit. And I feel queer. Now, he needs to stay with that feeling to let it happen. The feeling queer is a complex experience in the body 
which has in it implicit meanings. If he says, oh, I must check it off, I feel great. That is a, a tempting, too abrupt a change, too large a, a, a step forced on him from outside. Uh, <coughs> trying to leap ahead rather than staying with the experience of it. If he goes on, oh well, just queer. It's my illness. Always like that. Queer. He is distancing himself from the experience, objectifying himself in his illness. It's my illness. Like a thing. Like a thing he talked about in his work earlier on. Uh, and it can remain blocked. So Joe says, I feel queer. I say, now, look, let's stay with that feeling. Maybe something will emerge. And there's a silence. And then he said, well, it's just strange. Mixed up like. There has another silence. And Joe becomes more and more tense. Now, I feel tense too. And I sense some fear somewhere in my chest. You know, when we were sitting, I, I meant to ask you afterwards if you were feeling in your body whereabouts. Uh, but it's, it's in the chest somewhere. I, I'm not sure where, but I, I find myself putting my hand over my heart. I say, I feel, uh, I feel it, it's scary. I mutter that, but I know you didn't hear me at the back, you I muttered. And, uh, are, are you hearing better, Ambrose, now? Uh, well, well, you must shake your hand in the air, because I forget, you see. Uh, so he says, well, yeah, yeah, that's a part of it, but, yeah, well, yeah, something like that. He sits back and relaxes a bit. Now, there's been some shift, just a step, but not a large one. I say, uh, odd. Sorry, I missed out something. He he used the word odd some earlier. I, anyhow, I pick up his word. Odd. I say, <laughs> well, I bet you're scared now, like you talked about when you were, when as a lad you first went to work. He said, yeah, I did then and before that, going to school and leaving mum standing at the door. He seems absorbed. I lean forward, nearer to him, opening my fingers wide and say, well, it makes me feel, I'm talking about me, it makes me feel sort of, uh, sort of wobbly in my middle. I mean, now, scared, yeah, yeah but, but, but excited a bit. Uh, and there's something new, but sort of not knowing about, not knowing where. See, what, what, what I'm hoping for, um, it, it is, look, that not knowing where, staying with the experience, but yet going ahead and exploring with uh, Joe. He's ceased to be Joseph Brown, Esquire, and is now Joe. Um, so I pause, and Joe sighs and smiles. A soft smile. He said, yeah, wobbly. That's just bang on. And who's to his tummy? He uh, goes on. Um, what, uh, what, 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 like, uh, like trying to walk. Uh, like a kid, I mean. He sighs, and a, a tear trickles down as he smiles. Now, it's not often that we get bang on in um, Sahagasahedipa. Or in spiritual direction, or indeed uh, with our friends, or our husbands and our wives, or whatever, or the, the, the butcher in the, the shop. But when we do, there's that sense of release, 
a body relate a bodily release which is yet more than bodily a sense of significance and a meaning when things come together and that's it insight a seeing into a feeling into which carries things forward and is guided by the um, future it's the possibility uh, of being able to walk well John and I have been searching for the right phrase verbal and non-verbal phrase the right metaphor wobble walk expanding fingers the correct feeling language the right image the word gesture for this specific situation now it's the next step that can be taken which keeps the continuity now a so-called correct interpretation and it might be correct is absolutely wrong if it's too far away uh, I put correct in inverted commas right there are Joe and I to, 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 to together and yet we're alone we've been searching for the next step and we need to focus and the next point is about focusing goals emerge from this immediate experience it's not a matter of adding on goals there's not a, a, any old way of going forward only a few possibilities now it's from the wobbly the word wobbly from which the new experience emerges focus on this specific situation uh, and the further steps as I said are implicit in it now it's important to remain also with what I call a whole feeling well of course uh, I don't experience the whole of myself but there is a sort of attitude uh, of trying to stay with the whole feeling a felt meaning of the sense of my own life at this moment and a felt direction as distinct from abstractions or notions from outside and I have stressed by the word feeling uh, I'm using it much more than in the motion now my concern in therapy then mainly is the how and not the what the manner in which expressions are related to raw experiences and not so much uh, as the contents such as infantile memories or fascinating fantasies now I'm not saying that the latter are not important they are but in my mind they are not the fundamental they will emerge they will emerge with the therapist in conversation and the model I hand around is called a conversational model so the psychotherapist's job seems to me to be one to help the, the, the patient to attend more directly to the preconceptual feeling now uh, I'm gonna skip uh, two is to listen and by listening I mean watching I mean one's eyes one's ears and perhaps sometimes one's touch how is this person living in the moment and to be state fumble for the metaphors I'm going to end uh, the pre lunch period uh, with the quotation which some of you have haven't heard it's from Wilka and he's talking about writing a verse but what Wilka says seems to me to apply to the most simple understanding statement in psychotherapy or indeed in um, loving Milka says and those of you who I don't blame you my other abstractions have gone off to, to say please waken up because if I'm not worth listening to Milka is <laughs> verses are experiences in order to write a single verse one must see many cities and men and things one must get to know animals and the flight of birds and the gestures that the little flowers make when they open out to the morning one must be able to return in thought 
to roads in unknown regions, to unexpected encounters, and to partings that had been long foreseen, to days of childhood that are still indistinct, and to parents whom one had to hurt when they sought, whom one had to hurt when they sought to give one some pleasure. Give one some pleasure which one did not understand. There must be memories of many nights of love, each one unlike the others, of the screams of women in labour and the women in childbed, light and blanched and sleeping, shutting themselves in. One must also have been beside the dying, must have sat beside the dead in a room with open windows and fitful noises. And still it is not yet enough to have memories. One must be able to forget them when they are many. And here is the important thing for a psychotherapist. And one must have the immense patience, patience to wait till they come again. For it is the memories themselves that matter, but only when they have turned to blood with his in us, to glance and gesture, nameless, and no longer to be de de distinguished from ourselves. <coughs> only then can it happen that in the most rare hour, the first word of a poem arises in their midst and goes forth from them. I will just read that sentence again, but in my own word. In a ten-minute in interview with Mr. Brown, sometimes by the dark in, in, in um, the visible workmanship, in a most rare hour, the first word of understanding can arise in their midst and go forth I think we should start now because uh, Dr. Hobson has still things to tell us and speak to us. Well, yes, it's not really quite that. Because I said very honestly uh, yesterday that I haven't really come here to uh, lecture, I've come here to help. Uh, and I'm so sorry, uh, I know this lecture needed a week's more work to cut it down but if, if, if I don't say certain things I, I, I should be so um, not wobbly that's a good word we'll come back to wobbly I should be so disintegrated in my middle uh, that uh, and so I'm purely selfish uh, except I, I'm selfish because I'm asking for you for some response and even if the discussion was short, the response in your face is just something to you. But uh, we ended before the break with Wilka, with his cities of men, <coughs> and things, animals, birds, and the little, the little flowers opening in the morning, encounters and partings, hurting parents, nights of love, women in childbed, and the dying, and the, the dead, the memories forgotten, and the patience to wait for them until they had been turned to blood where it is in us. That's what technique is about. Now, what I am is what myself has made of my experiences. I say it again. What I am is what myself has made of my experiences. And knowing someone is a different language, as I've tried to say, from knowing about. And from the handout, I don't know that I've made it clear, but by language I do not mean just words. I do not mean just a non-verbal uh, uh, 
gestures, although by language I mean a way of being with people, of living with people, uh, I'm indoctrinated by Wittgenstein, by the later Wittgenstein. Uh, nine. You remember Jung's interview with John Freeman? Yes. And I wonder how you understand that statement, where, whether you understand it like I do. When Freeman asked him about God, he said, I don't believe. I know. Yes. I can't, uh, I, I put it into a Lancashire accent because I, I, I love that to have the, the uh, Zoe accent, but it seems nearer to her, to, to her young lady. I know. Now, now see, what did he mean? I don't think he thought he was meaning, I don't think, he was meaning knowing uh, like I, I know uh, about the Yerkes Dodson law. I think he was using the word knowing in the sense which I'm trying to imply about knowing persons. Uh, you might not agree with me, Vera will have put me right who knew Jung so well, uh, but and I, I only knew him a little bit. But I, I, I did feel that I, 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 I had a feeling of knowing Jung even in the few times that I met him. However, what I want to go back to is to Joe Brown uh, and the psychotherapist. And I'm going to cut it short. And you must ask um, things in the um, short time we might have. Uh, but what, what, what are the problems in what I'm going to say? It's the manner as I said, it's the how more than the what. And the psychotherapist is committed to a relationship and must be willing to be lived with now. Uh, yes, the patient has got to find his own steps forward, but he can only do that in a relationship with a therapist who risks himself He's involved, and he must be involved. And those of you who are social workers or psychologists, we, we have no junior doctors here, when your teachers say you mustn't get too involved, you say, look, nobody ever learned anything without getting over involved and um, struggling through it. But we are involved, and he needs to be open. I'm speaking now very differently from the way that I would have spoken 20 years ago and the way that I, I was trained. But the older I grow and the more open I am about my own feelings with the patient. Um, we were talking about this um, yesterday there, weren't we? Uh, it's got to be a genuine conversation. Now, that's not to say it's my job to burden my patient with all my personal problems, talking about myself, but I, 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 I need to be open about what I, I feel, and the more, uh, the older I grow, and the more open I become. Because I think the worst thing is to patronize somebody. Mm -hmm. And I think I've done a lot of harm by saying, oh, this is a patient, I must protect him or her, and really not respect him. Yes. But <coughs> there are snags, and I want to tell you one of the snags and what happened with Joe. And I can't go away without saying this. Well, there was one point at which Joe was going on and on about the difficulties of being a shop steward. And these were very important matters, and John Mead almost made me alter my whole lecture uh, and talk about social and political uh, factors, which I think are vital. Um, but I got bored, John. Uh, anyway, I got bored. You see, Joe was a good shop steward, uh, and he couldn't half talk when he got going. Um, <laughs> But I, 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 I felt out of touch. 
Now, I did my, my best to follow the, the 20 points, and of course, when I start thinking about the 20 points, I know something's wrong. You, you know, <laughs> like thinking, I must keep my head about straight. You, you, you get on up and down. It's not, I mean, no, I'm good. However, I started thinking about the point. Right now, I must amplify the mm -hmm. statements he's making. Uh, and I said, yeah, it's uh, difficult to keep to the party line. Uh, you really must feel bad about it, but I reckon you're not feeling too good now. You see, one must never say it to a patient or to a friend. Right? You don't mean that. Really, you mean something else. <laughs> so everybody always means what they say. Everybody. Anyhow, we always <laughs> mean what we say, uh, but we don't always know what we mean. There's always something more. <laughs> 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 the psychotherapist's job is to amplify. And Jung, Jung really was so good about this, and particularly talking with him. You know, you never be deduced, you never say, this stands for that. What you say, I mean, he might say, shut up on some occasions. I'm, Lord, do that, which I, 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 I shall come to. But to amplify, yes, you mean this, but maybe you also mean something more. That, I think, is the fundamental, and some of the most experienced analysts, I think, do not know their job because they do not do that. That's a, a very omnipotent Hobsonian <laughs> statement, <isn't it? laughs> I must stop it. Um, however, I did uh, my best with Joe, and I tried to point out to him, I said, look, go on, you know, you're avoiding something important now, but it was no good. So I said, look, Joe, I'm bored. <laughs> now, Joe blocked and got into a panic. And it didn't su uh, um, subside that curve by the end of the uh, session. And next day he felt too scared to go to work. Now, what, what I'd meant was that this talk is boring and not coming from your middle. But he heard, Joe Brown, you are a boring person, mm -hmm. and had felt attacked and for a moment almost destroyed. My remark was a persecuting one. But at a later session, we got to it. And at the later session, he was once more making speeches. <laughs> uh, he almost converted me to the very conservative uh, right-wing trade unionism of today, very unlike my boyhood, but not quite. Um, this time, I said, Joe, you know, this way of talking makes me feel bored. I can't get the feeling. And I reckon somehow you want to stop me getting into it. He said, yeah, yeah. I suppose, I suppose there is something or other. Well, I responded, let's both shut up for a bit and be quiet. Now, sit back and rest a bit inside. Let things happen. There's a need for silences. And we mustn't get scared with the analytical dogma to interfere and say, look, let's have a silence. Uh, there is a need, in my view, and I, I, I'm preaching a Hobsonian point of view, uh, sometimes when we're going to say it. And after a few minutes, he spoke. He said, sad. Yeah, yeah, that's it, sad. But now when it comes, when I welcome it, it's somehow different. And you're not going away for too long. It's the manner which is important and not the content. The sadness is important. But when I welcome it, uh, yes, I'm sorry, when I welcome it, uh, 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 um, it um, changes. It's the manner. Now, to pretend one can or should always be absolutely open <coughs> is naive. And perhaps we can talk later or over lunch about anger, which is very difficult sometimes. <coughs> but the eventual aim, in my view, should be to be as open as possible, and to aim at a conversation, which at first is going to be asymmetrical, 
but it is going to become more so magical. And the question in the face with is how persons make themselves in living, how I carry myself forward, I move, allow myself to carry me, a being and putting all the existentialist hyphens here, a being amongst things, a being amongst people, a being with persons, a being with myself. When Joe confronted, and really confronted, his emptiness, that hole inside he talked about earlier. Uh, not as a thing, but almost in a personal way. It changed. He lived beyond it. But do let me say, it's not always so. And in all of us, it seems to me there's a heart of darkness and death and, and essential loneliness. You know, my God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? And we can only act authentically. I know it's about it's it's an issue's word, genuinely, fully, from the cross as well as from joy. And some of us, it seems, have been called to have more of the cross. I'm going to miss out the section we can come back to <coughs> on the uniqueness, the responsibility and freedom of Joe Brown. He isn't just a shop steward or a patient a label, a, 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 which are labels, he is Joe Brown. And he is a Joe Brown choosing. 